Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a podcast about learning to learn. I'm Z from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts around the world asking your questions and hearing their stories, all before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 8 of the Tomato Timer, and today we have with us Jazz. And the story with Jazz is quite interesting. He was at the Accelerator program that I'm on, the Educate program at UCL, and he was just leaving, and we ended up kind of living together and he said hi and we just got into a conversation and what he was telling me was super interesting and yeah we got all the we walked all the way to the station together and we were like oh man we need to catch up so then yeah out of the blue we had a new relationship a new meeting and so let me tell let me ask Jazz to introduce himself so hey everyone my name is Jazz and, and thank you for your time today I really appreciate it I graduated in accounting and finance I didn't really want to do accounting and finance I just thought, hey, let's complete it anyway, because I wasn't sure what else I wanted to do. Um, after that, I set up a gluten-free food company with the University Entrepreneur Program. Um, and after that, I went to work in Switzerland for a pharmaceutical company. Didn't find that too interesting. So then I joined uh, management consulting at PwC, in which I built two businesses, uh, one being the disruptive innovation practice. And I also helped build the firm's artificial intelligence practice. Um, but through that work, I got quite a wide range of exposure to different industries. And that's led me to kind of where I am today, now helping people with their education choices. So Jazz, I know that you, when, we, when you first introduced yourself, you told me a bit about AEO Labs. Tell me a bit more about what, what your program is At the moment, I'm building an education about. startup that helps young people make better and more informed education choices in, in terms of your education and both your careers. Um, the reason I looked into this is because I studied accounting and finance at university, and I really regret that choice. I wish I studied computer science, right? given how fast the world's changing. And as I looked into problem a little bit more, I found that actually 50% of people that go to university regret going to university. And there's a similar stat for the number of people that they regret their subject of choice. Yeah. And if you look at some of the reasons as to why that happens, one might be because people don't understand themselves well enough yet, mm-hmm. um, and they still need to test a few more subjects. Two, people don't have the right advisors around them, whether that be their parents, their teachers, because those people don't have the knowledge to help their children make more informed decisions themselves. Uh, so this became a problem that I was quite passionate about solving. And, and that's where I ended up um, creating AO Labs and seeing you on the Educate program. The next question I had for you was, what do we do in terms of us as students when we're looking at the changing landscape of the job world, where most jobs that we're going to be going into are not interesting anymore or they're not going to exist? What's the best way to prepare for something like that? Sure, it's a good question. The way, the way I've been thinking about the world of work and education lately is what skills are going to be valuable and what skills are going to be valuable over a longer period of time, right? So if you think about skills such as social skills, such as emotional intelligence, adaptability, those skills I think will be valuable throughout your careers. Uh, and then there might be some skills that are not so valuable throughout your careers, such as financial modeling, but they're useful, right? And so as you think about the jobs you're, or the areas you're looking into, always think about the types of skills you can build that will future-proof yourself. Because I think that no job's going to exist for 50 years. People will be constantly adapting themselves. And that's just something we've got to get ourselves used to. And also people's interests change. So a career you might be interested in for the next five years, you might want to change your career after that five years and change to something else. So I think as you think about the future of work changing, start to think about, right, you're going to need to prepare yourself to be adaptable. So what skill sets can you build that will make yourselves resilient over time? Awesome. And one of the questions that we had, uh, I'm going to try to go through those as well. What do you think about when we're talking, especially to our parents, about something like entrepreneurial roots, like we want to set up our own business? We're sometimes told that we should still go out and study a degree regarding some sort of skill like medicine or engineering and then go down the business or entrepreneurial route. What do you think about that, especially given that you've gone down that route yourself coming from an academic background? Yeah, sure. So I think it's a good question. And depending on your own backgrounds, parents will kind of have different input into your careers. My view on it really is if you if you think about the logic where parents are coming from, parents just want their children to be secure and um, earn good money and also be relatively happy in their jobs. So jobs such as accounting, back in the day were relatively good jobs, but accountants don't really earn that much good money now unless you make it to a senior position in certain companies, right? 
So I think there are elements of parents' guidance that are useful, but also the world's changing so fast now that parents can't are not often up to speed with just how fast the world's changing and what skills might be useful. So if someone was, if a parent was advising me and they said, hey, you should do medicine, I think I would take what I can from their advice, but then I'd also say, hey, but do you know the world's changing super fast and actually the skills that are getting um, rewarded in terms of high pay right now are skills such as data science, um, computer science, um, you, you know, having deep, deep expertise in neuroscience, those will be rewarded. Um, and then you can have a more intelligent conversation with parents as well. Absolutely. Whereas I think normally the conversation goes, hey, you should get into medicine and be a doctor. And then the child says, hey, I don't want to be a doctor. And yeah. then it doesn't go anywhere else. But if you have a more informed conversation with your parents, um, you can definitely have a more productive conversation. So I guess the kind of challenge for us is that a lot of times when we're talking to our, our parents or our, our mentors, we, we, we have some sort of idea, whether it's an entrepreneurial one or not. We, we want to share this with them. But sometimes they don't have the widest perspectives. They come from so many different backgrounds in terms of their experiences. And maybe they don't really see that as clearly as we do because we're going through a time where disruption is literally happening at every moment. We can we can see it in our technology, we can see it in the apps and the way we're using kind of you know, interacting with the world. So I guess your advice would be to approach that conversation with a little a lot more research. Um, and try to make them understand not only are we are, do we have this idea, but we actually have research backing this kind of choice and what that's what I want to show. What do you think? Yes, exactly. Because, you know, you, you want to show your parents that you're listening, but you also want to show them that you're really informed and you've done your research. You, what, what, you wanna, what you want to make your parents feel comfortable is to de-risk your future. Mm -hmm. Parents have one view of the stories and the thing, the experience that they've learned, and they'll say, hey, you should do X. What you're trying to articulate to them is, hey, I understand that X is valuable, but actually in today's world, Y is also just as valuable and it's of more interest to me. Yeah. And then with your research, you can say, here is evidence showing that Y is more valuable or as valuable. So for example, if you're interested in data science, you could show Facebook salaries or Google salaries of data scientists um, or even average salaries for data scientists in London or Canada or wherever it is you're interested in. But that's evidence that you can show. And then you can also say, hey, look, I've researched the past to get to data science and there are numerous paths and, you know, data science is going to be a valuable skill over the next 10 years for sure. You could say something like that. So I think it's just about showing parents that you understand their point of view, but also you're really, really researched and prepared in your point of view and you've spoken to many people and you're still willing to go down this path. Yeah. So let's go. Let's talk a little more about um, the research aspect of things, because we sometimes like I know that when I went out to choose my degree, I still wasn't sure about it and how it would work out. And although I'm super happy with it, I, I wasn't very good at that kind of research of what a degree looks like. So um, how, how do you, what's a better or more informed way of doing that? Like what modules I'm going to see, study, what the sort of degree looks like, what people do with that degree in the future and how it's kind of like, how it's structured, all those things. What's what's the best way of, of looking at that researching and understanding the not only the, what the degree entails, but what perspectives that, that degree opens for you. So, so first of all, I think once, once AO Labs have built the software that we're building, that will definitely be the best way. <laughs> but and, and until then, I think there's a, there's a, there's a few ways of doing this. Um, I think you want to find a combination of trying to understand yourself and what you're interested in, and also matching that with what is valuable to the world and what is the world willing to pay for. So if you take the second bit, which is what is valuable to the world and what is the world willing to pay for, you can you can find skills in demand reports on the World Economic Forum website, which is always good. I think they do it yearly with the, the most in-demand skills. So it might be data science or, or something else. You can also look at different websites like uh, MIT might have published something or Nesta, which is a, a big kind of UK organization focused on all sorts of stuff, including learning and development. So that the goal of that is to say, hey, what skills are going to be in, are in demand now and likely to be in demand over the next 10 years? Then I would also look at reports such as, all right, what are companies hiring for? Where are companies, where do companies have gaps in their skill sets that they're willing to pay a large amount of money for? So that's on the demand side of things. And then you've got to try and fit that with what you're personally interested in. Right. So if you're interested in data science, it works. If you're interested in a totally different field like medicine. So my my family, my sisters, uh, one of them's a dentist and one of them is also studying medicine. I would say, well, again, are you happy with the, the normal doctor job and the normal dentist job? 
And if so, then great. But if you're not, then try and couple that with trends that you're seeing. So in medicine right now, we're seeing a lot of, um, yeah, med tech. You're seeing companies like Babylon provide um, GPs on demand. So, you know, combining that kind of medical knowledge with some sort of computer science knowledge might add value to you in the market. So it's just about a combination of what are you interested in? What is the world willing to pay for? And where's that sweet spot where I can kind of position myself in between? That's a really good way of looking at stuff. Um, so you mentioned something earlier. Well, actually, we'll, we'll go on to another question. Uh, well, this is one that's been asked by our, our, our audience. I'm not aware of how, how, much, how deeply you've looked at this, but um, do you have any thoughts on the IB program and the A-level program since you're coming from, um, I think, an A-level program? But have you, have you done any more research because of AEO labs? Sure. So I don't know too much about the IB program. I can share a link in the group after because I just I did a little bit of reading. But from what I, I'll talk about A-levels in more detail. But from what I understand, the IB tends to be more suited for people looking to develop a broader set of skills because it covers a wider range of topics. And A-levels might be more preferable if you kind of know the areas you want to develop skills within and focus on because you can choose, say, four A-levels, right? So, so that's just at a high level. I think from, from my reading, both are tend to be quite recognized around the world as the world's becoming a lot more globalized and universities are trying to attract talent in. So it sounds like both of them are credit, credible, but I'll share that link and, and people can do their research as well. In terms of A-levels, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I chose maths, biology, physics and chemistry. And I think that gave me a broad skill set because, again, even, you know, as I completed my A-levels, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I think for that reason, A-levels are useful and you get you get you tend to get somewhat of a deep um, knowledge base because you study them over two years. But interestingly, what companies are really looking for, so companies like PwC, when they're hiring people, they're looking for skills like emotional intelligence. So people could study English at university or philosophy or history and they could still become a management consultant it helps if you've gone to a prestigious university but you could still get into consulting because what they're really looking for in the interview process is okay this person's emotionally intelligent and they'll be able to handle um, different client situations um, and and stressful projects so i think that's one thing so for example pwc hire a lot out of an initiative called teach first so teach first helps people become teachers over a short period of time um, and teachers will obviously have to deal with lots of challenging situations um, and handle a number of students. So they make typically would make great management consultants because they've got emotional intelligence. They can handle stressful periods, but also handle lots of demanding clients, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. So I wanted to build on a question I kind of I kind of asked before. You're talking about skills like data science and computer science. And maybe that's not something we're all interested in. So what's a skill that's not exactly academic, but it's you feel is one of the most important things in this world of disruption and something we should all be working on? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting because people typically used to rave about IQ, which is, you know, you can get graded on based on your, um, like you can do tests online and and see what your IQ is, your IQ is which is intelligent quotient, by the way. By the way. And then I think there's a, there's been a hype around emotional intelligence. Yeah, EQ, exactly. Um, which is really your ability to, to kind of work with other people, handle other people, understand what other people are thinking. Also your self-awareness. I think, you know, if you can see if someone's pretty self-aware and it makes it a lot easier um, for you to work with other people. So I think emotional intelligence is huge. Um, and lately there's been another um, term that's come onto the market called um, AQ, which is adaptability quotient. And I think that's going to be quite important over time because as different jobs and skills start to get um, automated by technology, we're going to have to constantly kind of adapt, adapt, adapt. And, and that's something I've been doing subconsciously, if you like, where if, if, if I get bored of a job or I see that actually someone else can do this job, I'll try and find something else. But really, it just, it, 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 you can kind of define it as the ability to adapt and thrive in fast-changing environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I guess we need to get more adaptable. And what are what are some ways we can do that? Because it's a it's quite a soft skill. How can we start developing that? Um, we're usually not given the opportunity to become very flexible, even at school, where our education is just system is designed to be, you know, based on rote and memorization. It's very structured. You know, you're going to go and do this and end up with an exam. So how can we start developing adaptability even at high school? So for me, adaptability, like part of it comes from having a curiosity. 
and then taking action on that curiosity. So for example, right now, so I did a data science course while I was at PwC, right? And that was because I was curious about machine learning and I wanted to, and by picking up that skill, you're naturally more adaptable because you can go and pursue a path that's of interest to you, but also valuable to the world. So I think part of adaptability is being open-minded with change, willing, having a curiosity and willingness to explore different things, but then also having a hunger to take action and actually get on with it and learn stuff. So I think if you're open-minded to the world and how it's changing, you've got a curiosity and then you're, you're action prone. So you'll take action, you'll learn something on Udacity, Coursera, whatever it might be. You, you've got a little bit of a willingness to take risks. I think um, those are some of the components that will help you become adaptable over time. So I've noticed on your profile on LinkedIn that you've done lots of online courses which have enhanced your current profile um, and understanding you have in, in different areas that you're interested in, uh, like data science, as you mentioned. Um, so how is that kind of online MOOCs style or online systems, online degrees perceived by employers and how has it benefited you? Yeah, sure. So the world's changed in a, in a way in that you know, 20 years ago, it was a must to go to university and you'd get a good job and eventually you might get an MBA or something and then you'd get a higher pay grade. I think in today's world, technology coming through, companies are open to people that are self-taught programmers, for example, and they'll hire you. So nowadays at PwC, Google and Facebook, you don't necessarily need a degree to get hired. And there are a lot of talented self-taught programmers. So the rules of the game are changing in a way that and are changing pretty quickly because university is expensive. So if I was making the choice again, I'm not sure that that would be the best option, depending on what you want to do. Now, having said that, university does give you some really good life skills. Like, um, you meet a lot of good friends. You learn to kind of manage projects. Um, you learn time management. So I think from a life perspective, it does teach you a series of good skills. But employers are becoming more open minded to, I think, how they acquire the skills they need to do the work that they need to get done. So question from the, from the audience, uh, is it more important to go out and get a new skill or improve on a current skill that you have? So that's kind of a broad question. What I'm trying to, let me focus it down a bit. I guess at high school, we, we, we usually study certain you know, subjects and we start developing skills such as programming, if you're doing some computer science or a bit of math, uh, some sort of, uh, like if you're doing more artistic stuff, you, get, you develop those techniques. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is, these kind of skills we're exposed to at high school. Should we be willing to take the risk of diving into complete, something completely new? Because what you're talking about is we need to find something we're passionate about, and that's what we need to kind of drive forward. What if we don't know yet what we're passionate about? Yeah, it's a great question. I think you should absolutely dive into something new and discover, and use that as an opportunity to discover if you're interested in that subject or not. Because if you dive into something and you find out that you're not interested in it, then that's great because you've learned that you're not interested in something. I think I think in today's society, there's too much pressure to say, oh, hey, have you found your pre passion? Oh, you haven't found your passion. And people get stressed because they don't know what they're passionate about. But I think there's not enough focus on continuous experimentation. Like, for example, myself, you know, I produce music as a hobby. Uh, I didn't know I was passionate about that. I just tried it and I've continued it and it just feeds my curiosity. There's been lots of things that I've tried that I'm not passionate about, you know, aspects of consulting that weren't interesting to me, I stayed away from and aspects of consulting that were interesting to me, I stayed um, more interested in. And no doubt, I'm going to find new interests. Um, and some of my interests now might die over time. It's just the way it works. So I think don't put too much pressure on yourself to find a passion or everyone has that. I think it's about constantly testing, experimenting with things until you find things that are interesting. Um, but, the, if, but if you're not testing and experimenting things, then you're not really doing anything to find your passion, if that makes sense. So that's almost a requirement of it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think we're getting closer to the end of the episode. So I wanted to see your perspective on this, since not only were you employed in one of the biggest firms in the world, but then you left it all behind and decided to choose an entrepreneurial route at, on all of this as, as, as at a very young age. You're not very far from us in terms of the age. And how has that experience shaped you? What kind of advice would you give to us, you know, taking, like if we're at high school, what, what do you think we should be looking at? What should we trying? What should we be trying out? I think one thing I've learned as I've gone through the, the different routes is you, for every experience you put yourself in, it is your responsibility to take as much from that experience as you can. So that, that's, that's number one. So for example, when you're, when you're working in consulting, 
sometimes it's tiring, sometimes it's exhausting, sometimes it's extremely enjoyable. It's your job to grab and take as much from it as you can and learn as much as you can. And that's one thing I'm, I do because I'm pretty curious and I'm super hungry to learn and grow. Um, so that comes naturally. Similarly with entrepreneurship, being one hell of a ride this first year, I haven't made even a quarter of the progress that I've liked to make. Um, but again, it's my it's my responsibility to try and learn and take as much from the year as I possibly can, um, because no one else is going to do that for you. I think so. That's that's definitely something I'd take. The other thing I'd say is, it, as you go through these paths and journeys, you're on your own mission and adventure. Like, don't worry what anyone else is doing. Don't worry what the next person is doing, and don't compare yourself to anyone because I think that creates a lot of stress because everyone wants to be the best or jump to the top of the pyramid or grow faster or whatever it is. But if you learn to really focus on yourself and your own path and some paths, um, sometimes, you know, you'll go further down the path. Sometimes that path might close and you want to do something else. It's all totally OK. As long as you just keep trust in yourself and you and you keep kind of adapting over time, I think you'll be OK. OK, so one last question, which has nothing to do with academics, entrepreneurial stuff or career advice or anything. I'd like to know. Um, we heard from your biography that you're a burger fan. So tell us a bit. Tell us a bit about that. What's your favorite burger? Yeah. So this is just one of those random things I'm curious about as well. So I love burgers. Um, I know it's not the most interesting food, but it's a. Uh, it's just something fun to go on a hunt. So I was traveling a lot for work, and so what I do is every city I um, explore, I try and have the top two burgers in that city. And then it became a thing with my friend. I was living in Belfast for a while, and that's. There's a, there's a pub there called the Barking Dog, and they've got a three-day slow-cooked beef burger you know, to the vegetarians out there. Um, but that was great. And it's just a bit of fun. So every time you travel or you reach a new city, it's something you can do to explore as well. So that, that's where the best burger is at the moment. Perfect. It's been great to have you, Jazz. Thank you for everyone joining in today. And we'll, we're very grateful to have you here. Any links and any things you want to put into the channels, Jazz, that'll be great. Perfect. I'll drop the AO Labs Discord channel for sure. Um, and I'll also share my Twitter handle. Thanks, everyone, and have a good day. Everyone, thank you for joining in, and we hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.